From February 1976 to March 1977, the quiet suburbs of Oakland County, Michigan were terrorized by the abduction and murder of four children between the ages of 10 and 12. Concerned for the safety of their children, parents and neighbors banded together to form neighborhood watch groups and to escort children to and from school or other activities. The once safe streets of suburban Michigan felt like a danger zone, with every stranger becoming a potential suspect in the minds of fearful residents. This is the story of the Oakland County Child Killer. On February 15, 1976, 12-year-old Mark Stebbins and his mother Ruth attended a pool tournament at the American Legion Hall. After spending some time at the tournament, Mark started feeling tired and asked Ruth for some money so he could go buy something from a hobby shop that was nearby. Ruth refused this request as she had already given him his pocket money. Despite not getting the money he was looking for, Mark did not appear to be upset but instead asked Ruth if he could go walk home by himself and watch a movie. Ruth did not seem to have an issue with this so she agreed and around midday, Mark would leave the American Legion Hall and walk for roughly 0.75 miles or 1.2 kilometers to reach his home. Later in the day, Ruth tried contacting Mark by phone to check on him, but there was no response. She arrived at her home just before 9 p.m., but Mark wasn't there, so she decided to wait for a couple of hours. It was now 11 p.m., but there was still no sign of Mark. This made Ruth very concerned and she eventually contacted the authorities to report him missing. Ruth filed a police report and after the police received this, their first thoughts were that Mark may have been out with his friends or had possibly run away since there had been no kidnappings in Ferndale for a decade. Despite this, they still launched an extensive search throughout the area where they looked through abandoned buildings, trash cans and other possible locations. Ruth couldn't get over the thought that her son had disappeared. It made her extremely anxious and she stayed up all night constantly hearing noises and hoping it was him. Over the next few days, she would set three places at the dinner table hoping that Mark would return home, but he didn't. On February 19th, four days after Mark's disappearance, a businessman named Mark Bodekheimer left the building where his office was located and walked towards a nearby drugstore. As he was making his way towards the drugstore, something in one of the corners of the parking lot had grabbed his attention. It was a mannequin wearing jeans and a blue jacket on a pile of snow. Out of curiosity, Mark walked closer towards the mannequin to get a better look at it, but upon closer inspection, he realized it wasn't a mannequin. It was the corpse of a child. Not just any child's corpse, but the corpse of Mark Stebbins. The police were contacted and they quickly arrived at the crime scene. Mark's body had been deliberately placed in a sleeping position near a dumpster as if he were merely asleep. The police noticed there was bruising and other injuries on Mark's body which suggested he had been beaten and tied up. A medical examination was conducted and it revealed Mark's death resulted from asphyxiation caused by smothering. But there was also noticeable rope burns on his neck, wrists and ankles. Upon further investigation, authorities believed that Mark had also been essayed. There was something very strange about the murder that was also noticed. The killer had washed Mark's body, manicured his nails and his clothes had been laundered and ironed. It was as if the killer had taken care of him, which earned him the nickname the Babysitter Killer. This may have been the first time the Babysitter Killer had struck, but it was certainly not the last. Enjoying the video so far? Then make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Now, let's get back to the video. On December 22nd, 1976, just three days before Christmas, Carol Robinson was cooking dinner and asked her 12-year-old daughter Jill if she would help her make some biscuits. But Jill refused to do so. They started arguing as Jill had a bit of a habit of confronting her mother on occasion. Carol, who was now fed up with Jill, told her to leave the house. Jill went to her room, got dressed and gathered some clothes and a blanket which she placed inside a denim bag. She then left her home in Royal Oak, Michigan and rode her bicycle along Woodward Avenue which was about 4-5 to five blocks from her home. It was now 11.30pm and Jill still hadn't returned home. Concerned, her father Thomas had contacted the authorities to report her missing. 
At first, the police suspected that Jill had run away, just like Mark Stebbins before his body was discovered. They presumed that Jill might have gone to her friend's house or even her father's place, as Jill's parents were divorced. But she was never there. The last confirmed sighting of her was at a hobby store at 7.30pm. Since the authorities thought that Jill had run away, her case was not treated as an abduction or that of a lost child, and no extensive search efforts were conducted to find her. Even though her bicycle was discovered behind that hobby store on the night she vanished. But this incident wasn't a runaway, it was a murder. On December 26, 1976, a motorist discovered Jill's body along Interstate 75, which was roughly 20 minutes from her home. Similarly to Mark Stebbins, Jill had been brought to the location by her killer, except this time she had been shot in the face with a 12 gauge shotgun which had pretty much blown half her face off her head. She was clothed in freshly laundered and pressed garments with her backpack still on her back. An autopsy was later conducted and the results of the autopsy indicated that she may have died from shock and hemorrhaging rather than the gunshot wound itself and there was no evidence of SA. On January 2nd, 1977, in Berkeley, Michigan, 10-year-old Christine Mihalik asked her mother, Deborah, if she could go to a nearby 7-Eleven store to buy a magazine. Although Deborah didn't usually allow her daughter to make these kinds of trips alone, Christine had completed an errand for her earlier, so she reluctantly allowed her to go. Deborah gave Christine directions to the store and urged her to return quickly, which Christine agreed to. After half an hour passed, with Without Christine returning, Deborah grew increasingly worried and contacted the police to report her daughter's disappearance. Deborah was extremely worried and anxious for the next 20 days following Christine's disappearance, and she could not bring herself to rest. She kept a constant vigil, hoping for Christine's safe return, and even went on television to ask the public for help. She raised a $17,000 reward, but none of these measures taken would bring her daughter safely home. Christine's body would be discovered by a mail carrier in a snowbank located at the end of a cul-de-sac in Franklin Village, which was roughly 16 minutes away from her house on January 2nd, 1977. When the authorities arrived at the location, they discovered that Christine's body had been carefully positioned in a manner similar to that of the other two victims. The killer had picked her up, cradling her head and leg before gently placing her in the snow. The murderer had closed Christine's eyes and crossed her arms before covering her with snow and patting it down, which left behind very obvious handprints. Her corpse was so frozen that authorities had to postpone conducting an autopsy until the following day, and when it was conducted, the authorities confirmed that Christine had been smothered, although they did not disclose the item used. While there were no clear indications of SA, it is believed that did happen. As with the previous victims, the murderer had washed Christine's clothes and body and she had been killed less than a day before she was discovered. On March 16, 1977, 11-year-old Timothy King was left home alone when his parents went out for dinner, as they didn't plan on being away for too long. At around 7.30pm, Timothy asked his sister for 30 cents to buy candy from a nearby drugstore, which was located about three blocks away. Timothy left with his skateboard, telling his sister to keep the door open for him. He then proceeded to walk towards the store, which was situated on Maple Road. At 9pm, his parents arrived home with the door still open, but Timothy was nowhere to be seen. After Timothy was reported missing, his family searched for him in various places, but to no avail. By 9.15am the following morning, the police were contacted and a task force was called in to assist with the investigation as Timothy was among several other children to have disappeared in the same region which raised a lot of concerns. That same morning, the authorities set up their headquarters just a few blocks from Timothy's home and the police went door to door and interviewed his classmates as part of their investigation. After several days of searching, Timothy's body was eventually found on March 23, 1977 in a ditch along Gill Road. The discovery was made by a motorist who noticed his remains which were located close to a busy intersection. Despite having been missing for several days, Timothy was still dressed in the same clothes he was wearing when he left for the drugstore 
and his skateboard was discovered around 15 feet or 4.5 meters away from where he was found. An autopsy was later conducted and it was revealed that Timothy's kidnapper had taken good care of him. He was fed his favorite meal, KFC, and his body was thoroughly cleaned and groomed. It was also discovered he was essayed during his captivity and later suffocated. So the big question is, who was the Oakland County child killer? At the time, the investigation into the murders was the most significant of its kind in the history of the US, which prompted that specialized task force to be established. The task force received a huge influx of over 11,000 leads, but most of these turned out to be dead ends, until one witness would come forward with some crucial information. The witness reported seeing Timothy speaking to a man in the drugstore's parking lot, about two car lengths away from her. She provided a description of the car she believed the man was driving, an AMC gremlin that was dark blue with a hockey stick shaped white stripe on the side of the car. Other witnesses accounts of the man seen talking to Timothy helped investigators to create a profile of the suspect. The profile suggested that the kidnapper was a Caucasian male aged between 25 and 35 years. He had a complexion that was rather dark and a sturdy physique. A job that allowed him to move around freely and made him appear trustworthy to children, was familiar with the area, and could keep children captive for extended periods without creating any suspicion from neighbors. Every owner of a Gremlin vehicle in Oakland County would be questioned by police as part of their investigation, but despite their efforts, the killer remained at large. In December 1978, the task force was stopped as it had used up its budget of $2 million and the Michigan State Police assumed control of the investigation. Following Timothy's murder, the homicides had stopped, which led the authorities to believe that the perpetrator may have either left the region, been apprehended, or passed away. Over time, law enforcement officers focused on multiple suspects, including some with records of child the body of one suspect was even exhumed, but none of these leads yielded conclusive results. There may have been conclusive results if the police didn't handle the investigation so poorly. For instance, the police moved Mark's body before the medical examiner was present at the crime scene, and instead of the morgue, they transported it to the Southfield police station. If that wasn't bad enough, the authorities had also removed his clothing, which ultimately ruined and tainted any potential evidence that could have been present. As for Jill, the police waited 48 hours before launching an investigation, because, as I mentioned earlier, they treated her case like a runaway instead of an abduction, which left behind potentially valuable evidence. On top of that, neither the sheriff's department nor the state police lab were called to the crime scene when Jill's body was discovered. By keeping the case in the public eye and continuing to pursue leads and advancements in forensic technology, there is hope that one day, justice will be served for the victims and their families. Until that day comes, the community remains united in their determination to uncover the truth and to ensure that the tragic events of the Oakland County child killer case are never forgotten. Thank you for watching the video and don't forget to subscribe.